Most people have heard of the notorious Alcatraz. It was designed to hold the most dangerous criminals and keep them out of society. But back in the day, three prisoners were known to have escaped the maximum security prison by dodging the guards. It was declared that three of them lost their lives in the icy water. But a strange turn of events occurred in 2013 when a mysterious letter forced the FBI to reopen the case. Frank Lee Morris was 11 years old when he became an orphan and was placed into the foster system. He soon learned how to become self-reliant after being moved between a bunch of different foster homes. When he was 13, he connected with the wrong people. That was when he was convicted of his very first crime. At 13, no one would ever guess that he would be the person to orchestrate the great escape from Alcatraz. By the time he was a young adult, he had seen the inside of several prisons across the U.S., and eventually, he ended up in what people refer to as the Alcatraz of the South in Louisiana. He managed to escape and roam free for a whole year before he was being caught again. The authorities weren't taking chances this time around, so they decided to send him to the maximum security prison, Alcatraz. During his time there, he crossed paths with the Anglin brothers and a man named Alan West. Frank Lee Morris, John, Clarence Aglin, and Alan West became the best of friends during their time serving in Alcatraz. It just so happened that each of the men had their own unique skill sets that they would need in order to pull off the greatest escape known in the history of America. They used their individual knowledge to come up with the perfect escape plan, and it was all led by the cunning Frank. The plan was simple, but it seemed impossible. They would have to pull it off perfectly if they wanted the plan to work. But they weren't the first to try and escape. In fact, more than 30 others made the attempt before them, and they all failed horribly. What made these men think they could succeed? They were housed in adjoining cells, which made it easy for them to plot out their plan. They took their time to plan out the finer details of their plan. They were making sure they were prepared. But before they could do anything, they had gathered the needed materials for the job. But lucky for them, Alcatraz was a factory too. The factory was used for inmates to work in. They would make furniture, clothing, and shoes for the U.S. military. The men had access to all kinds of material used to their advantage, but they had another rare advantage that ensured that they had the upper hand. They were all non-violent offenders, which was rare in Alcatraz. This means they experienced less scrutiny from the guards. This means that they could easily operate right under the authorities' noses. They began building their needed props for their escape. They knew that they had to do more than just escaping the fortress. They had to make sure they had enough time before the guards realized they were gone. Each man got given assigned tasks that had to work together seamlessly if they wanted the plan to work flawlessly. The Aglin brothers had to make dummy heads that would be left inside their cells. The dummy heads were made from soap wax, toilet paper, and human hair, which they found in the barber shop. Frank had to make an instrument that looked like an accordion, while four men worked together to make the instruments they would use to unscrew the bolts of the vents and tunnel out of their cells. The idea was insane, but would it work? The men fashioned crude picks and wrenches from the materials they found around the prison. The items included spoons from the cafeteria and pieces of wood from the workshop. Every day from 5.30 p.m. to 9 p.m., the men worked relentlessly, discreetly chipping away their cells and widening the holes so that they could fit inside. But what was on the other side? As the holes and cells widened, they could see the unguarded utility corridor on the other side. There were bars along the walls that the men could use to climb up three stories to the wide shafts that onto the roof. On that fateful evening in 1962, the men pried one of the shafts open with their homemade wrench, got into the roof, and disappeared into the night. But they had left one man behind. They had to leave Alan West behind when he couldn't widen his hole in time. The men had made life vests and a raft by gluing and stitching more than 50 raincoats together, and Frank's accordion instrument was used to inflate the raft and the life vests. After that day, Frank Lee Morris and John and Clarence Anglin were never seen again. Because no car was reported stolen in or around Angel Island, it was presumed that they had never reached the shore, until now. In 2013, the FBI was forced to reopen the case after the San Francisco Police Department received a shocking letter signed by a man claiming to be John Anglin. However, the letter's contents weren't disclosed to the public until 2018. The letter begins, My name is John Anglin. I escaped from Alcatraz in June 1962 with my brother Clarence and Frank Morris. I'm 83 years old and in bad shape. I have cancer. 
Yes, we all made it that night, but barely. The letter continued. Frank passes away in 2008. His grave is in Argentina under another name. My brother died in 2011. This is the real and honest truth. I could tell you that for seven years of living in North Dakota and a year in Fargo, North Dakota until 2003, living in Southern California now. But that is not the only claim out there. There was another escape attempt that ended in the prisoners considered missing. But did they ever make it out? Theodore Cole and Ralph Rowe were partners in crime so naturally they became partners in prison too. The two were infamous bank robbers that eventually got caught and ended up in Alcatraz just like Frank Lee Morris, John and Clarence Anglin, and Alan West. But who were they and how did their escape attempt differ from other previous escapees? Both men lived in Oklahoma and became good friends before deciding to get into the life of crime. Not much is known about Theodore Cole or Ralph Rowe before they started breaking the law. The two started robbing banks in the mid-1930s and were eventually caught, but they didn't go straight to Alcatraz. The two men had robbed many banks by the time they had been convicted, but it seemed that the judges was relatively lenient, not booking them a boat straight to Alcatraz. You'd think the men would be grateful. But the men would take their chances in their new prison and test the warden's patience far beyond its limits. The two men went to Oklahoma State Penitentiary, McAllister Prison. The prison seemed suitable for what they had done, but soon the judge would be proved wrong. The men would try their luck to get out. But their attempt ended in them getting caught, their first escape attempt, but nobody knew they'd try again. After their first escape attempt, the men were sent to a high-security facility in Leavenworth Prison. There, they were listed as escape risks and were only held there temporarily. It seemed a judge in the state had better ideas for them. They would be sent to the infamous escape-proof prison, Alcatraz. Ralph Rowe was originally caught by the police after a shootout in 1933. This resulted in his partner, Wilbur Underhill, passing away. This was the first time he was caught by the police. Records are not clear how Rowe got out and started robbing banks with Cole. But it seems Cole's punishment for getting caught would be far more severe. Not much is known about Theodore Cole before he was convicted. Other than that, he was born in April 1899. He is only famous for his escape attempt with Ralph Rowe. But after being convicted, Theodore got a dooming sentence which explains why he was desperate to escape, a death sentence. The two men had planned to escape months in advance and used their unique jobs to orchestrate the plan. They worked stripping old tires into rubber mats. These men spent months in the workshop grinding down the window bars and hiding the damage with tire grease. But how did they leave the island once the plan was in motion? Cole and Rowe disappeared between 1 a.m. and 1.30 a.m. at count when the night was pitch black and the fog around Alcatraz was at its thickest. The men broke the bars they had weakened for weeks and dropped down to the beach below. But it was there that their trail went cold. The tracks of the beach disappeared and officials assumed the men used makeshift floats made out of tires to swim off the island. The problem was that the current could easily have swept them into sea. But over the years, there have been many eyewitness accounts of the men being sighted. So that begs the question, did the men make it off the island alive or did the current sweep them to sea? No one can be sure until more evidence show up.